Um, so I want uh, to welcome our audience to um, this conversation uh, with uh, Ambassador Dory Gold, who um, has a superb contribution to the current issue, the second of four issues of Sapir, which is a limited edition uh, journal, uh, just four uh, issues published by the Maimonides uh, Fund. Felicia Herman and I um, edit the journal. The first one was devoted to the subject of social justice. The second one in which Ambassador Gold's uh, really brilliant essay appears is on the issue on uh, power. Our third issue is going to be on the subject of continuity, uh, Jewish continuity. And fourth issue, uh, to TBD, as they say, but we are, we are developing uh, ideas, for, uh, ideas for it. Um, but uh, when, we, when we thought about uh, the subject of power, uh, Jewish power, um, uh, power as, as, as the Jews use it and as is used uh, uh, toward uh, Jews, we were very keen um, to make sure that we had the practitioner's point of view. And in asking uh, Ambassador Gold uh, to, to write, we certainly um, were um, uh, tapping on the expertise of one of the, uh, I think, great practitioners of Jewish uh, power um, as uh, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations in the first Netanyahu government as director general of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I want to call it the second Netanyahu government, but probably it was the fourth or I forgot which, which, which electoral uh, period uh, it took, uh, in which it took place. As one of the lead, if I may say this, lead negotiators in the um, uh, creating a new diplomatic framework uh, with uh, Sunni Arab states, um, very prominently including Saudi Arabia, a series of secret talks, which later came, uh, which later have helped come to fruition in the form of the Abraham Accords. Uh, and I, I, I wanna put the, make a final uh, remark by way of introduction, Ambassador, which is to say all of this also uh, being conducted by a person who's not only a practitioner, but really um, a scholar, uh, has long been a scholar and an expert on the region, um, and the author of what in, I think, 2003, 2004, was a really seminal and important book, which I want to discuss with you, uh, Hatred's Kingdom, which was about Saudi Arabia, um, with which you later had a uh, you were able to lead something uh, like a, not only detente, but a kind of a, 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 a rapprochement. So with all of that in view, it's, it's just an absolute honor to, to, uh, to invite you to this conversation, Ambassador. But I wanna begin, if you don't mind, just tapping on your mind as a, both a scholar and uh, of the region and, and a, a commentator on the region. We are in the midst of this, um, what seems to many of us a, uh, an American debacle uh, in uh, Kabul uh, uh, as the Taliban retake the country, 20 years of an American-led effort to remake Afghanistan into something uh, very different from what it had been during the first Taliban uh, era. So I wanted to begin by just asking you for a, a general sense of what this moment means, um, uh, not just uh, for the uh, brand of moderate uh, um, uh, politics, which you've been seeking to cultivate in the region, but what it means really for the United States and American power uh, in, in the Middle East. So, so the floor is now, now yours. Well, thank you, Brett. Uh, I'm a big fan of your columns and your work over the years. And so it's a real pleasure to be here. And I have great expectations for the journal. Thank you. Well, let me get right to your question. Um, I think for all of the countries that have been under the wings of the American Eagle, this is a very tough time. 
you know, you don't have to prove that events in Afghanistan will affect events on the Jordan River, which is, I don't know, 3,000 kilometers away. Um, but you sense it very strongly. The enemies of America watch this moment with great joy. The friends of America are very concerned and wonder what are the assumptions in the American foreign policy community today as it goes forward in trying to protect American interests. Um, power is a big factor. In the Middle East, it's an extremely important factor without having to be abused. But um, when America unilaterally pulls out and everyone understands the position uh, the U.S. was in, it leaves a really, I don't want to say bad taste in our mouths, but it leaves us with a lot of concern for the future. So from the perspective of um, the new condominium between uh, Israel and the moderate states of the Sunni world, you mentioned the Jordan uh, uh, River, but um, how do you begin to shape what seems to be a foreign policy for what might be a post, not a post-American world, but a post-Pax Americana uh, world? What, what should um, decision makers, not only in Jerusalem, but in Abu Dhabi be thinking at a moment like this? Well, you know, I, I've had a little scheme I've been working on over the last eight months or so. And it was actually born out of an Israeli-Saudi dialogue between NGOs in uh, 2015. Back then in 2015, I felt that if I went to Washington by myself or with a group from the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, which I had, and I sort of exposed our feelings about the JCPOA, that's the Iran deal. If it was another lecture by an Israeli, people would go, oh, all right, you know, I'll go to an APEC conference if I want to hear that. But I thought that if we and uh, a Saudi think tank would appear in Washington together and sound our ideas, and if those ideas were similar, I thought it would have much greater impact. And that's precisely what we did. And I saw by the quality of the audience that came to the Council on Foreign Relations where we held this joint meeting. And um, today I feel that we have to team up with our Sunni Arab allies. And I use that word ally with great confidence to bring the data we have about the region to Washington, New York, of course, London, Berlin, so that we're all on the same page, because lately we haven't been. And um, maybe then we have a shot of reforming a new security consensus for the Middle East with our Western allies. But that's the work that has to be done in my judgment. Is it your perception that the Biden administration is simply a third Obama term? Or do you think this is an administration that has learned, even as it's essentially uh, alumni of the Obama administration, that has learned any lessons from, especially Obama's second term when he turned towards Iran with uh, the JCPOA, the withdrawal from, I was gonna say the withdrawal from Iraq, the lesson seemed to be that if you withdraw completely, you end up having to go back in. But give us a sense of your, give, give, give us your sense of what this new Biden team is thinking and is it in any way different? And if so, better or worse than the, the Obama team? Well, it's still early in the Biden administration. But uh, I, as an Israeli, advise my countrymen 
Although, you know, we can turn on CNN and Fox in the morning when all the main news shows come on in Israel and join the festivities um, with strong political opinions, we have to recognize that Americans elect their own government and we have to work with the elected government of the United States. And although we may differ, and we may differ strongly with that government, depending on the policies they decide to pursue, we have to somehow make it work. It comes upon us to make that effort. And of course, you know, it may, may be what we're trying won't work out in the end, but that is what we have to that's what we have to do. One is a superpower, one is a small state, and the small state has to live with its superpower, Hella. But, well, let me, let me press you on this because you begin your essay with the 2015 speech that Prime Minister Netanyahu gave uh, to Congress over the vehement objections of uh, of the Obama administration. There were a lot of people then there, including a lot of friends of Israel on the democratic side, certainly, who felt that this was um, needless meddling in, 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 American, uh, uh, in American politics. Now looking back near more than six years after that, um, did that speech accomplish uh, what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu set out for it. Well, the article I wrote in Sapir reveals that something else happened, which may be or maybe not the Prime Minister had been working on or hoped for. Because what happened was not a revolutionary change in the policy of the Obama administration, but rather um, a whole new approach that became visible to us in the Sunni Arab world. And slowly but surely, communications between Israel and the Sunni Arab states increased. And, you know, they, it became clear, um, understood the dangers of the Middle East the same way we did. And the basis for a real alliance between former enemies became very real. So again, maybe that's not what uh, those who wrote the speech had exactly in mind, but that is certainly what evolved. No, it's, it's true. I remember vividly um, a visit, this is actually a couple of years before the speech in 2013, right after Right after Obama's red line in Syria was was breached to basically no consequence, and then on the eve of the pre JCPOA, which I think came came in uh, uh, November of twenty, I think it was around Thanksgiving of uh, twenty thirteen. Um, uh, a visit from a well-known Saudi prince to the Wall Street Journal who kept repeating almost to his own amazement, I can't believe it, I agree with every word that Benjamin Netanyahu has to, uh, has to say on the subject of, of an agreement with Iran and on, on, on the broader Middle East. So, so clearly a light bulb went off in the eyes of, of senior Saudis. But 10 years before then, of course, you had written Hatred's Kingdom, um, which really detailed in a most extraordinarily comprehensive way the extent to which Saudi Arabia was profoundly implicated in the kind of Salafist, uh, Wahhabi-inspired terrorism that had uh, uh, culminated so horrifically in 9-11. In so from the point of writing that book onward, what changed in Saudi Arabia uh, and how dramatically did it change? Well, first of all, now looking back on the period 
in which I wrote the book. I wrote the book in 2003, 2002, I think it's copyrighted. Um, when I wrote the book, we had overwhelming evidence that Saudi charities were involved in moving serious money to jihadi organizations like Hamas. We were in the middle of the second intifada, which you might remember produced buses blowing up in the heart of Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa. I was there. And yeah, 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 yeah. So you know. And, you know, when we found the financial links, you know, we spoke about it and I wrote about it. But today, how much of the Saudi, how much of the Hamas budget comes from Saudi Arabia? I'm guessing zero. 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 Nothing. Their policies have changed. They just arrested a whole group of Hamas operatives in Saudi Arabia. This was unthinkable back in 2002 when I wrote the book. So the world has changed. Ideologically, the body that was busy exporting an extreme form of Islam around the world from Indonesia to Kosovo was the Muslim World League. Well, I think two or three years back, the head of the Muslim World League took a delegation to Auschwitz. Talk about contrasts. So you can't look at Saudi Arabia through a 9-11 prism. Saudi Arabia is a different country. And I think we in Israel have to find ways to reach out to Saudi Arabia, as well as its other neighbors, to build a, an alliance of moderation for the Middle East against the forces that are threatening us today. Today in Saudi Arabia, my impression is that there are, with respect to Israel, two factions. One, uh, I don't know if he leads it, but he certainly is a spokesman for it. Uh, Prince Turkey, the former, uh, who I think you've, you've uh, parlayed with on a number of occasions. Yes, I have. <laughs> uh, former Saudi ambassador to the United States, former head of Saudi intelligence, who nonetheless has been fairly scorching on the idea of uh, a, uh, at least joining the Abraham Accords with, with a, you know, opening a, a Saudi embassy in, in, at least in, in, in Tel Aviv. And then another faction, I think closer perhaps to um, I don't know if it's the foreign minister Jaber or if it's MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince himself, who would like to really advance relate the relationship. Can you give us a sense of what that dynamic is, is, all, is all about? How's, how it's playing out? Well, as you hinted or as you made reference, um, I have had interaction with Prince Turkey and that specifically occurred at a, a meeting of the International Institute of Strategic Studies in Bahrain. They have an annual conference there. And Prince Turkey, unfortunately, was tough, critical. He got the floor because he was a prince and he was a minister. I was of a lower order. And, but nonetheless, I approached him afterward and i laid the facts on the table you know the facts on the table like you would speak to the head of an intelligence agency i said you guys were helping out hamas now you're not and therefore i'll do everything in my power to convey that fact around the world and i wanted him to know that in many respects the underlying assumptions of hatred's kingdom no longer apply in fact, they're wrong. And I wanted him to hear that from me so he doesn't just run around college campuses saying Dory Gold is uh, conveying uh, a new kind of hatred against Saudi Arabia. That is not the case. Well, I bet you were never so happy as to admit, uh, uh, at least uh, after the, you know, uh, that, that, not that you were wrong at the time, but the event, you know, time has, 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 uh, changed the, the thesis. 
What about Mohammed bin Salman? I mean, obviously, since the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in the Saudi consulate in, in Istanbul, perception of him has gone from, you know, intrepid modernizer to um, uh, deranged, uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the deranged and overgrown child in running around in, in, in Riyadh. But what, what, should, what should American policymakers, what should Western policymakers uh, think about MBS and what he's trying to do and whether he has not so much the desire as the competence to bring about a real social revolution in his kingdom? Well, I think he has the competence and I think he's an extraordinary individual. I'm dying to meet him at some point, be introduced to him. Um, I've but... met him. <laughs> oh, you have? Okay. He makes yeah. an impression. Pardon? He makes an impression. Uh, he's a guy. What was your impression? Well, he reminds me of uh, FDR's characterization of uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, F and he's, FDR said it affectionately. He said, Winston has 100 ideas a day, and three of them are good. Um, uh, I mean, clearly, MBS has a very uh, expansive vision, you know, turning, and, and some of it perhaps realizable, turning Saudi Arabia, for instance, into a tourist mecca, taking advantage of the Saudi coastline along uh, uh, the Red Sea. Um, some of the vision has, in fact, come about. You, you go to Saudi Arabia and women are, you know, are driving. There has been a significant change socially in the kingdom in the last 10 or 15, uh, uh, 10 or 15 years. He's extraordinarily energetic. Um, on the other hand, from what I have read of the uh, Khashoggi murder, I don't know if he wanted Khashoggi uh, dead, um, uh, and and my impression is that he did not, but the, his his henchmen botched the job. But that the only way in which you bring about social change in a conservative Islamic country, something the Shah discovered to his cost, is not by not necessarily through liberalization, but a certain kind of uh, repression, um, because you have to repress the forces you think of um, as illiberal. So there's a kind of contradiction in the heart of um, liberalization programs as they've been carried out in repressive uh, Muslim countries. And it's what brought down the Shah. Um, it's, uh, I think, largely what explains the, the, the failure of secular forces in Turkey. It's what you have unfolding in Sisi's Egypt. Um, but you have a guy who on the one hand sees himself as a modernizer and yet the apparatus of the state is as repressive as, uh, as ever. And I think MBS is dealing with exactly that, that same paradox. He wants to bring the kingdom, if not into the 21st century, at least into the 20th century, right? But the only way in which he can do it is by an apparatus of repression, particularly against uh, that part of the population which is not on board with with his modernizing vision so it's it's i think it's a deep problem uh that you know whatever else you say about him or think about him it's a deep problem that all leaders like him in uh, have, have had to have had to confront so that was my impression i mean he spoke nonstop for about two and a half hours and you walked out and it felt like you had been um sort of experiencing a mild electric shock for the entire time. Uh, so it was certainly, you know, a memorable performance, but the, obviously the jury is, is, is very much out. I know that there's a limit to what you can say, but is it safe to assume that the level of cooperation between Jerusalem and Riyadh right beneath the surface in terms of intelligence, in terms of security, perhaps in terms of certain economic issues, is vastly greater than, than the public that is generally acknowledged publicly. I think that's been going on for a long time. Uh, long, how long do you mean? Well, you know, I was, you know, I used to work at the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies in Tel Aviv 
and we'd hold these strategic conferences. And we had a conference where Ariel Sharon was speaking. He was, um, at the time, he was not a minister in the government. But all of a sudden, he unveiled that Israel and Jordan worked together against Egypt in Yemen in 1962. So I heard stories of this, but I never heard it confirmed by somebody at such a senior level. So I think we have had an ability to communicate with most of our neighbors, but it was so ideologically you know, anathema to the people who wrote columns in the newspapers that it never really came out. Well, now it can come out. And uh, now it becomes clear that we have to find areas of cooperation. Some of them are in the military security, some of them are in the economic sphere, and some of them are in other, other areas. But they really show that Israel and the Arab states are on the same side of the fence. Let me, let me now talk about, I think this is what people really particularly keen to hear your views on. And obviously a great unifying factor for Israel and its Sunni neighbors has been the uh, rise of uh, Iranian, the, the ascent of Iranian power uh, in, I mean, obviously since the Khomeinist revolution of 79, but particularly in the last uh, several years with the prospect of a nuclearized um, Iran, First question, do you think that the Biden, do you think that the moment for reestablishing or re, for the United States returning to the JCPOA has passed with um, the Raisi uh, presidency now in, uh, uh, in, in, in Iran? Is there, is there, is that process as far as you know, dead and buried and uh, how do you think American diplomacy is going to play out uh, toward Iran in the next couple couple of couple of years? Well, we've had these kinds of questions and challenges before in the past, when new presidents of Iran were suddenly elected, I should say, chosen uh, by the supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. And um, it was expected that the new president would bring about more moderate policies. Of course, he didn't. Uh, I think the way people look at Iran in the West depends on certain schools of thought that have emerged in Western governance. And some of those see that Iran is the true ally of the West that who attacked on 9-11? Sunnis. This is what they say. This is when they sit around at a coffee shop and talk about <clears throat> the subject. Sunnis attacked, not Shiites. And so those who take this position tend to uh, build up Iran as the natural ally of America and the West. Of course, they misread Iran completely and they don't understand the full implications of Iran with nuclear weapons, which we may find out about very soon. Uh, can you, well, that, that was a somewhat portentous <laughs> end, to the, end to your answer. Uh, so let's talk about Iranian nuclearization, despite, you know, very uh, visible, hits to the Iranian nuclear program, uh, thanks, I'm told, to the Liechtensteinian uh, Secret Service. Um, you're looking at me quizzically. That was a joke. Uh, it, it, took me, it took me about 10 seconds to figure out the joke, OK? <laughs> uh, maybe it was the Luxembourgian Secret Service or, or that, that somehow uh, is responsible behind these unexplained explosions and uh, uh, events uh, throughout, uh, throughout Iran. But despite all of that covert effort, and despite the Trump administration's uh, very 
punishing sanctions. Uh, Iran is now enriching uh, to ever higher degrees, enriching its uranium to ever higher degrees of, of purity. Uh, and announcing it. And announcing it. We've had stark warnings from Israeli political leaders that the, the window is getting uh, smaller and smaller, that they're closer, the, the closer to breakout uh, than ever. So what are the options? What are the, what are, what should, uh, what should American and in particular Israeli decision makers be contemplating? Well, I have never been a big believer in diplomacy with Iran, that is with the current Iranian regime. I have been acutely aware of Iranian violations of all the deals they ever made with the West and with the United States. I would say certainly uh, since 2003. And the violations were so transparent, so clear. I mean, for example, when the Iranians would start um, digging uh, earth at, a, at an alleged uh, nuclear site and taking out the whole, let's say six feet down of, uh, of, um, uh, of an area that, the, we, that in the West, we believe that this was a, a vital portion of the nuclear program and destroying that or, or dispersing that dirt or whatever they were taking out. And, and this was done to hide very clear work that they had done and accomplishments that they had already had. Um, and this went on in a number of Iranian nuclear sites. So when I certainly who you know, read about these things and uh, was aware of them, saw that happening, I said, well, wait a minute. The first most important thing in an arms control deal is being able to trust the other side and certainly verify everything that they're doing. And I didn't see Reagan's adage, trust but verify, being possible in the Iranian context. So I became very concerned. I became concerned because I understood also Iran's intentions. Iran seemed determined to get a nuclear weapons capability to threaten the existence of the state of Israel. And we had to behave that, uh, <laughs> as though that was the case. So uh, two, two questions, and by the way, I should just briefly interject to everyone listening in. Uh, either in the Q&A function or if you prefer the chat function, I think it's a good time to start uh, putting in your questions for, uh, for Ambassador, Ambassador Gold. I'll get to those as those start to accumulate. So two questions related. Uh, Defense Minister Benny Gantz uh, seemed to suggest in a recent remark that Israel would have to learn somehow to live with a nuclear Iran. At least that, that's the way it appeared uh, to, you know, on, on, on paper. So first question is, can in fact Israel live with a nuclear Iran? And second and related, can Israel live with Iran not as a nuclear state, but as a nuclear breakout state? That is to say, uh, a state that is capable of assembling a sizable nuclear arsenal uh, on very short notice, even if it doesn't possess it you know, uh, uh, immediately. Japan is also considered a nuclear breakout state. It could produce- They also use the word nuclear threshold state. Nuclear threshold state, thank you. So those two questions, uh, Israel with a nuclear state or Israel with a nuclear threshold uh, state? Uh, as its adversary? I think there's a real problem. You know, one of the things I taught myself and I studied, I brought into the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, which I had a number of experts who can do research in Farsi. 
And it became clear that the Iranian defense doctrine is very much influenced by religious Shiite considerations. That if the Jewish population, for example, in the world is destroyed, that will accelerate the arrival of the hidden Imam known as the Mahdi. Now, as much as this sounds like, you know, a Tom Clancy movie or something like that, that is the world which we're living in. And unless the Iranians can convince us that that is a misinterpretation of where they are, um, what is ideologically motivating them, I think the a nuclear Iran is completely unacceptable. And any of the models that might be put forward at the Kennedy School at Harvard, which sound very re reasonable and rational, are simply too dangerous for us to live with. Does a nuclear Iran or a threshold nuclear Iran state also mean a nuclear Saudi Arabia and a nuclear Turkey? Well, that is the rational conclusion, which neither of which are as dangerous as nuclear Iran, but as uh, nuclear proliferation spreads in the Middle East, the chances that we are living with a hair trigger system across our region increases and the region becomes very, very unstable. That's yet another reason to do everything in the, in, in the power of the Western Alliance to prevent either a nuclear Iran or a threshold nuclear Iran. And is it your sense that uh, Israel is the only country with the will and capability to prevent it? No, there are a number of countries that are not in the Middle East that could prevent it. Whether they will or not is another question. A number of countries that have the capability, and I guess the question is whether they have. Yes. Have, uh, whether they have the will. One final question before I start asking you about, um, uh, uh, or referring to questions from the, from the audience. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Lebanon, which typically gets short shrift uh, in, in conversations about the, about the region. And of course you wrote an essay, you know, about Israel entering the Middle East, which is, you know, in many ways uh, very true, but Israel's Northern border is still uh, a front of, of hostility and danger. And now um, perhaps more seriously of a, of a state collapsing before our, uh, before our eyes, uh, you know, tragically for the, for the people of Lebanon, some of whom are, or many of whom are going, uh, going hungry, um, perhaps uh, usefully from the point of view of, of the Iranians who are just consolidating their power in that, in that poor country. So is there, how should Israeli decision makers be thinking about Lebanon? Is the paradigm established in May of 2000, post-Israel post withdrawal, uh, still, a, still a useful one for, for uh, Israel? Could, could Israel stand to have a security zone again? Or, or what should Israeli policymakers, oh, you've gone dark. Then I'm back. Yes, it's, I realize it's, it's, it's evening in, uh, uh, in Israel, so the, the lights- are And I forgot to put on the lights uh, before we started this interview, which means I, if you would let me just get up for a moment. Why don't you, why don't you do that? Because you've been sort of receding into the shadows and, and uh, <laughs> much as I like your that was voice, like. Nice to Sounds see your like face. the Iranian nuclear program. Oh, much okay. better. 
Yes, we, can, we see you again. Um, uh, although it had a very film noir kind of, as, as, the, as the subject matter was getting darker, so were you. Um, uh -huh. uh, so just last question about Lebanon. What, what it, should Israeli leaders be thinking about a new paradigm with Lebanon or, or just a kind of a wait and see approach? Well, I think Lebanon is really a branch of Hezbollah and Hezbollah, as you know, is a branch of the Iranian security forces. So I think that's the, uh, should be the guiding perspective as we look at what's going on with our Northern neighbor. You know, Lebanon used to be one of the great countries of the Middle East and Beirut was one of the great cities. And it's a terrible shame that um, the uh, Iranian expansionism has led to such a degradation of the Lebanese state. And France doesn't have the will or the power to uh, assert its interests there. And this is, the United States is not in a position which it was in in 1958 when Eisenhower sent the Marines into Beirut. So um, Lebanon suffers, yet Lebanon remains a country with tremendous potential, tremendous uh, creativity, and has the ability to make a great contribution to the Middle East. But as long as it is under the thumb of Iran, that's not going to happen. Yeah, my old friend Fuad Ajami, who was uh, uh, Lebanese, of course, and a wonderful scholar once, I remember he's called Lebanon, uh, a garden without walls. Um, kind of a, a typically a Johnny-esque way of capturing quite poetically the tragedy of Lebanon. I'm gonna just turn now to questions because they're, they're, they're uh, coming in and they're lively. So let me see. Um, I have a quote question from our friend, Jeff Herf. Um, uh, is it the ambassador's view that the coming months or year will be the moment of truth regarding the issue of Iran's quest for nuclear weapons? Does he think that uh, due to Iranian religious views uh, that an Iran, Iran with nuclear weapons would likely not be willing to behave according to the secular logic of nuclear deterrence? You've answered that partially, but come back to it. Well, what alarmed me the most, if you start inquiring about the religious dimension of an Iranian nuclear weapons program has been this notion, and I'll just repeat it again, that in Shiite practice, the um, 12th Imam, the 12th descendant of Ali um, is expected to return and um, bring about something, I'll use a, a misapplied term, uh, something like a messianic era for Shiite Muslims and that this new era would be accelerated if Iran managed to destroy the state of Israel, its Jewish population. And that's something we have to very carefully monitor, where they're heading with their nuclear weapons program. It's not just because you know, their, their goal is not just simply to create a uh, copy of the Soviet American deterrence model. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about something far more dangerous. Um, Liz Wagner asks, uh, it's great that Saudi Arabia is no longer funding Hamas. What does Ambassador Gold think about Saudi Arabia funding anti-Israel and anti-American sentiment in the US, especially on US campuses? Well, what we need is a dialogue with them. And the dialogue is necessary to say, listen, guys, we want to work with you. We want to increase your ability to uh, neutralize those forces that you're most concerned with, but you can't have it both ways. And I think there is a change that has gone on in Saudi Arabia. And I think what we have to do is basically give them uh, quietly 
a, um, a kind of booklet which lays out what they, we believe they are up to and um, explain that certain activities are just not gonna be acceptable. This is not on the, the chat function, but just out of curiosity. Um, let's imagine by some uh, divine intervention, the uh, Iranian regime were to go away tomorrow. Iran returned to being kind of a normal nation state in the mold of what it was uh, during the period of the Shah without imperialistic ambitions. That, that's to say, cease to be a threat to not only Israel, but to the major Sunni powers. Would the Sunni Israeli rapprochement survive the loss of a common enemy? Well, I think it probably would survive because countries and peoples in the Middle East are concerned. What if this scenario doesn't continue? What if it changes? And you need plan B. And plan B is what we're in right now. So uh, I don't see it all dropping away. The mutual suspicion between parts of the Sunni world and parts of the Shia world is so intense it makes the Arab-Israel conflict look like nothing. So one should keep it in mind, but one should also expose the public in the uh, Arab world to, the, to how we, the Jewish people, and the uh, Sunni world have worked together in the past and can work together again. You know, whenever I get into debates over Jerusalem, one of the things I like to say to a Middle Eastern audience is the fact that after the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans, for 500 years, Jews were forbidden from living in our holy city. And when the second caliph of Islam, Umar bin al-Khattab, came into Jerusalem, he reopened Jerusalem for the Jewish people. That was not a permanent arrangement that you know, we should aspire to, but we should remember that they have been able to ideologically accept our presence. And um, you know, it repeated after the Crusades as well. So uh, I think we should expose the, each side to those higher points in our history and use that as a kind of inspiration for the future. I know that might sound naive to some people, but you can't have new policies without a narrative. And the narrative is there, it's in our history. And we just have to bring it out. Question from another, uh, uh, another person in our audience. Uh, wants to know, do you care about the unthinkable amount of loss? I think the answer is yes, but uh, do you care about the unthinkable amount of loss of support for Israel by liberal Democrats? Isn't that a loss of uh, an important part of Israeli security? I think Israel must base itself on bipartisan support in the United States. Now, what if that's not available? What do we do? Well, we should just do what we believe is right. I'll tell you this, when I was Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, one of the things I, you could say doggedly, um, sought was to get a breakthrough with South Africa. That was probably a bridge too far, but I took delegations to South Africa and I remember negotiating with the South African government, meeting their representatives in Pretoria uh, agreements, which we signed. And um, I found, oh, I remember now, I asked our spokesman's office to put out an announcement that while Israel is called an apartheid state on the campuses uh, in the United States, 
in places like Amherst, Massachusetts and Berkeley, California, the current post-apartheid government of South Africa is signing agreements with us. Now, why did I do that? Because I wanted to reach out to the liberal side of the American political spectrum so they should know Israel, Israel can have a discussion with liberals and progressives, even if our uh, security assumptions might seem very conservative. We have to reach out to both sides. And, and is, uh, is it becoming a bridge too far for, I mean, is it, is it too late to repair the relationship between Israel and some liberal Democrats? Do you, or do you, do you see that breach healing or, or just moving ever more, ever farther apart? Well, they certainly seem further apart today than they were when I was a student at Columbia University. But you got to make the effort. And uh, if I go back to government and even not being in government, I will make that effort incessantly. I think because, again, we need to have strong relations with the left and with the right in the United States. Um, another question and something we haven't talked about, but uh, it, it's a neglected and de depressing factor in Middle Eastern politics, um, which is Turkey. And uh, one person wanted to know whether Iran, the question was, is Iran a distraction from Turkey, which might be a bigger threat to Israel and the West in the coming decades? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, redo that question because obviously Iran is a major threat, but, but focus for a moment on, on Turkey, which has become quite hostile to, to Israel. Certainly after decades of warm relations, it's, it's, it's really descended, but do you see any change in Turkey's trajectory so long as um, Erdogan or the AKP are in power? Is he a is he a sort of a, a, a long deviation for Turkey or, or is he gonna typify Turkish foreign policy for a long time, even after he's off the stage? Well, the president of Turkey is a hard nut to crack for diplomats. Um, and he, he says things about Israel, which are not true. And he seems to want to pursue a policy which, for lack of a better term, is neo-Ottoman, resurrecting the Ottoman Empire. But at the same time, I don't think I would be unveiling secrets. He has reached out to Israel when he needs Israel support. I'm talking about Israel support, not American support. And I was a negotiator with the Turks. I met with very professional, well-trained um, uh, Turkish members of the foreign ministry, including its director general. There's a lot of work to be done with Turkey, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. We have to understand that um, Turkey has been pursuing a hostile policy to Israel, not in the sense of Iran. And we have to bring it, as, bring it around to a different uh, approach to us. And we have to talk to them about their concerns. That sounds very um, simple, but it isn't. And um, I believe that we can have a policy towards Turkey which might bring about a change. But right now it's, um, it's a good thing we have allies in Cyprus and in Greece. Final, uh, a final question. Reflect for a bit on the current uh, Israeli government. Um, it's a very strange and from the outside unwieldy coalition. Uh, is it gonna last? Look, there are objective problems which Prime Minister Bennett has. Normally, a, an Israeli prime minister 
in parliamentary systems um, base their power in parliament on having uh, a coalition of 25, 30, maybe even 40 seats. And if you don't have that kind of a coalition, you're not gonna last very long. Mr. Bennett has six seats. So it's somewhat unthinkable how he can manage that coalition. But he has proven that he certainly is giving it a try. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to put on a kind of a special cap and predict what's going to happen, but the circumstances are extremely tough. I wanted to say one other thing to you. Please do. Because we, we mentioned South Africa and we mentioned apartheid. The whole apartheid accusation and um, what has been going on, it's not just with South Africa. It's with uh, many different movements around the world is a danger which uh, I have been fighting against both in my think tank, but also in government. And um, I recall when I visited South Africa with a foreign ministry team as an Israeli official in 2015, 2016, um, I went to, uh, I visited um, the place where Nelson Mandela spent a great deal of his time right outside of uh, Johannesburg. And I learned that in outside of Johannesburg in another location, he would hide out from the apartheid police. And he hid out in a home that was owned by a Jewish family. And while he was there in this home, you know, there's no cable TV, there are no sporting events you can watch to kill the time. He read books. And one of the books he, he read while he was there was a book called The Revolt. And the author was Menachem Begin. I was stunned. And months later, I had to go to the opening of the UN General Assembly. And I requested a meeting with the foreign minister of South Africa. And I was granted the meeting. And at one point I asked my team to leave the room and she asked her team to leave the room. I was told that she was kind of a radical South African extremist. But I told her the story of Nelson Mandela reading Begin's book. And I said, the head of your national movement read a book written by the head of my national movement. And I don't know whether I melted the ice with that sentence, but it was clearly an effort to break down barriers and create some kind of new dialogue that didn't exist before. That's what we have to do with diplomacy. And that's what Israel has to do. We, your issue of um, Sapir it talks about power. The power can be supported by diplomatic action. And um, that's what will protect our security in the future. And that's what I tried to do when I was in government. And that's what I will continue to do in the future. That's a, that's a beautiful and revealing and unforgettable uh, anecdote and a good place to feel we could probably talk all day, but it's lunchtime for a lot of Americans. And uh, I wanna be respectful of their, their time. Ambassador, thank you for really, I mean, this is very far ranging, uh, very illuminating um, and uh, we're just delighted to have you uh, in our pages. Um, uh, so thank you. I mean, the subtitle of Sapir is a journal of, uh, of Jewish conversations. And uh, that's the purpose of, of these talks. Um, and it's conversations, by the way, that range uh, not only across time zones and borders, but also range across um, 
religious and ideological perspective. So I want to thank you personally for, for joining us for this last hour. I want to thank everyone who, 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 who listened in, and especially those who, who asked questions. We have more of these talks um, with uh, some of our uh, other authors, and I encourage everyone to, uh, to stick with it, because I think this is, uh, at least for the Jewish people, as important a conversation as it gets. So thank you. Have a lovely afternoon or evening, wherever you may be, maybe morning if you're in California. And uh, see you on our next talk. Thanks, Brett. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks.